My name is Maggie Kusick. I'm the Executive Director for Marketing and Communications. Um, I've been at Marion for nine years now, which kind of seems crazy when I look back. But um, I'm over in Oldenburg Hall with the rest of these folks, and we'll all introduce ourselves. But the reason that we are hosting these Mark on 101 sessions is, you know, really all of us are marketers in a way. I mean, we're out, we're brand ambassadors, um, we have opinions, we consume marketing, and all of that kind of goes into the strategy and execution of what the folks in marketing and communications are doing every day. So we wanted to offer some sessions. Um, first, we're starting off today with Mark on 101, a video training series. Throughout the rest of the semester, we'll also be offering a Mark on 101 social media training. And then later in the semester, for folks who use Delivero, which is our email software, we're going to be doing a training with those folks as well. So a couple different ones coming up for this semester alone. But video is one that people have asked a lot about. And I think it's because if you know, you're doing it with your phone, which is actually a really great tool that we'll also talk about today. So you, know, you want to know, if I can just take a video in the moment, how can I kind of maximize that opportunity? That's what we'll talk about today. We're also going to talk about some great equipment that we have that can be, um, we can loan out to you, you can borrow. And that will, if you're having an event or a presentation that you're thinking of down the road about, it'll kind of give you some food for thought on how you need to utilize some more sophisticated equipment. But um, never underestimate the power of the iPhone. Um, it takes really, really good video and photos these days. So when you're in the moment and you're seeing something that's happening, we're hoping to give you some tips and some tricks to optimize that. And then um, as the marketing team, you know, we're really excited to utilize that content. We are, with including me, nine people strong for the whole university. So it's really hard for us to be in all the places that we want to be. I mean, we want to be at all the events. I want to sit in the back of the classroom during your big presentation days and be able to record it all, but we just can't do that. So we started thinking, you know, if we can kind of tell you some ways that you can maybe capture some of this for us, how we can kind of help us support you and then even help marketing kind of achieve our goals in a more um, well-polished way with more diverse content. So that's kind of why we're here today. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues here to introduce themselves. Hi everybody, Peter Matsukas, Manager of Multimedia. Hi, I'm Allison Herring. I'm the Social Media Manager. <laughs> Ready to go? All right. Mag we gave Maggie this, like we gotta spread it out, we gotta do it now. Until we get to it. Sometimes I have to follow, but she's great at warming up the crowd. Thank you, Maggie. I really appreciate that. Um, welcome, everybody, to this video 101 tutorial, um, first of the SmartCom series. Um, I am the sort of resident content creator on campus. I've been here for nine years shooting video. Uh, First I was in IT, then I was absorbed by marketing, um, and then uh, I've been here ever since, and I've been shooting uh, promotional material, uh, shooting big on-campus videos, um, real con content with students, um, and other uh, large-scale uh, videos for fundraisers and whatnot. But I've been creating content for a long time, I do stuff on the side as well, I make films, um, and uh, we're making a documentary right now about uh, some exemplary Marion students and alumni, so uh, all that's in the pipeline. But this is a very basic tutorial to try to empower you to shoot content, to work with us in order to um, just increase our, uh, I guess, up our content creation uh, muscle on campus um, for you and also for us. We're gonna uh, give you a way to actually upload material to Marcom that we could possibly use because we can't be everywhere, but perhaps you are. Perhaps you're in classrooms or in dorms or wherever you are on campus and you can actually uh, capture content that we could possibly use. Um, and also just for your own lives outside of Marion, uh, always good to know a few things and the ring lights that we will provide will help you look beautiful for all, all your selfies. <laughs> Not you need it, you're a gorgeous audience. Or <laughs> web. <laughs> <laughs> And let me just preface this by saying I'm not the best with PowerPoint, but I'm learning, so if there are snafus, we'll just power through. So this is the first thing you have to ask yourself whenever you shoot something. It's pretty basic, but let's, you know, it's just, why are you shooting this video? Like everybody wants to, everybody gravitates towards doing that, like it seems like it's what we want, and perhaps we do want it, but, you know, what is the point of shooting it? And where do we want this video to live? Is it something that you think 
uh, should go on YouTube that can you know attract eyeballs and promote the university, promote whatever you're trying to promote. Um, can you shoot yourself with your equipment, or do you need the assistance of Markham? Uh, the camera that's recording this lecture, that's our, the camera that we use to shoot the actual performances, uh, global studies lectures, um, everything with Big Man, and that's sort of our, our big 4K camera on campus. Um, we, never, we don't really loan that up. I'm the only one who really shoots that. But, um, <laughs> But uh, we, have, we have other cameras we loan out, and your iPhones, as Maggie said, uh, will, could work just as well. Um, you know, most of them shooting 4K, um, which is amazing um, to have a 4K camera in your pocket. Most of the time, 1080 would be just fine, uh, but you should be able to shoot and record proper sound yourself or with something we can provide for you. But really, it's all about understanding why you're shooting it. Why, why do we do anything? It's good to be uh, self-aware in everything we do, but shooting video is no exception to that. Um, so first off about iPhones, or whatever Android or whatever phone you might have in your pocket that has a camera. Um, best practices. Uh, I believe in shooting horizontally, unless you're shooting uh, specifically for social. Uh, and Allison's going to be doing a social uh, tutorial in a few weeks. Um, but, you know, perhaps for Instagram or for other things, you know, okay. take out your phone and shoot something like so. But whenever I get something like that, it's hard for me to use it because I'm putting it in ed editing software and I have big black bars on the side. And I have to crop it, and when I crop it, it loses resolution. So we're, we're missing something. Um, so if you shoot something horizontally, like so, You'll go a long way. You'll be able to throw it in any, in any, in any editing software, from Premiere to an iMovie or whatever you use. I know there are tons of apps on your phone where you can edit footage. Um, I just think that's more of a professional uh, look. Uh, but if you're shooting something for Instagram, your stories, you know, it's perhaps you know dog videos. I watch those all the time. I prefer those even. You know, so if you're shooting better, you take anything away from this. Love your dogs. If you shoot dog videos. Vertical. Otherwise, horizontal. That's <laughs> my cats. I don't. Yeah, I don't really do cats. Um, I love cats. Uh, so, so horizontal shooting. It's kind of a silly thing for me to, uh, you know, sort of work. You know, so you can watch me. But if you if you if you're in sort of an athletic stance, you'll have better control over what you're shooting as opposed to maybe being against the wall. And you know, it's try to you know use your body to create um, a solid foundation for you to shoot. Steady video. Uh, again, know what you want to use your footage for. It'll determine what format, frame rate. All phones, or at least modern or modern versions of your phones, will have in the camera setting on the top right the opportunity to switch from HD to 4K. Um, 4K is extremely high resolution, um, and you know, you can shoot something that looks extremely cinematic if you shoot something at 4K and 24 frames. I mean, that's what people shoot feature films at. Uh, they don't do it on my phone, or some do. I mean, the film uh, escapes me, but it's, it was Steven Soderbergh. Um, Un Unreal? Unreal, I believe it was? With Claire Foy from The Crown. Um, all shot entirely at 4K on an iPhone. It, it looks that way, too. It doesn't look as good as it does on a real camera. But it was a novelty at the, at the time. But you can shoot 4K footage and it'll look beautiful. Um, I mean, if there's something really cinematic and you want to capture a real moment, you know, the, the, the knights like running out of the locker, running out onto the field, and if you have that one perfect angle, maybe you try to get that in 4K. But if you're shooting someone talking about a program or you're promoting something, HD, 1080, absolutely fine. You don't need that person in 4K. 4K is going to really, I mean, there are large files. They're going to be on your phone, and you know, I don't know how much footage you have, and you have to dump that footage immediately. It just, it's not worth it. Um, so you can, you should mess with that. Everything on your phone, you can, you have the ability to mess with and figure out what, what works best for you. Um, in terms of frame rates, you have the opportunity to go 24, 30, or 60. And on 
um, more recent iPhone models, you can even go into 120, 240. I mean, that's real slow motion. I mean, if you're shooting 120 frames per second, it means 120, 40, 120 frames are passing, well, I, I think about it in terms of film, in old school film, 120 still frames are passing through the gate in one second. So when you stretch it at normal time, it's slow motion, right? Back in the 1920s, when people were shooting on 18 uh, frame per second cameras, that's why everything was sped up, and that was like the base of, you know, everyone's running down the street and, you know, doing all their, you know, uh, 1920s or 1950s type things, like catching a train or whatever. Uh, the first films were all, uh, well, before the advent of real uh, uh, editing. Um, so my point is, 24 frames is more of a cinematic look. 30 frames is uh, broadcast quality. And 60 frames is not quite slow motion, but it could help you get some smoother moves. It'll slow things down and maybe give you a steadier, um, more smooth um, image. But I don't really dabble in 60 frames that much. 24 frames or 30 frames. I would say for basic iPhone use, HD, 30 frames per second, you will be set. But um, you have the ability to experiment with that. And I would say, let's, if you have any questions, hold them. We'll, 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 we'll have a little questions section. So if you want to check out a camera through Markov, we have this cute little guy. We typically don't have people wanting to use it at the same time. It's like, you know, the. There's never an issue with this availability of this camera for whatever reason. Um, we have some availabilities with issues with tripods, like not getting them back properly, things broken, slides missing. We're hopeful that if you take this tutorial and you check out equipment, you, res you respect all the equipment. Um, we are constantly having to replenish, and we're going to definitely have to replenish a little bit this year with tripods. But this is a very good prosumer camera that we have. And it's great because it comes with everything here that you see. Uh, power cord, an SD card. This camera can shoot up to 16 hours of footage. So I typically get it back from you guys. Not, I know there's eight hours and I, eventually I clean the card. But you can use it, shoot an hour uh, lecture, give it to someone else, they can also shoot an hour lecture. 16 hours of proper HD footage. It has pretty good microphones right here. So if it's, you know, if I'm shooting you, sir, and I have the camera right here, and you're speaking to me, and you're speaking in an audible, you're not whispering, we'll, you'll sound great, you'll look great. It's HD, uh, and it's an incredible prosumer camera. It's, it's, it's as easy as, you know, flipping it open, turning it on, um, and, you know, it's, it's like a prosumer camera. Uh, that works very well. Anytime you use this camera, you would come to me and I, I lend it to you, and we maybe go over like a brief tutorial. It's very easy, very intuitive. You don't have to deal with um, anything other than zooming. It's all autofocus, so you don't have to mess around with focus. Set it, forget it, like the Ronco versus Rebro, and um, you press the red button, and you'll shoot it. Um, and if you do use that camera, you can then give me back the camera, I will dump the footage, and I will edit the footage. I will, I mean, within reason. I can straighten out a shot that's a little askew. I can do a little color correction. I can do some audio work. I can throw some titles on the front and back. Um, so it's a 45 minute lecture, you want to get it, you know, I can, I can do that. That's, that's me that Marcom does. You know, it's not, it might take, a, you know, might take a little bit of time, but I'm pretty fast with that's not for me, it's just I throw it into the computer, I dump it, throw on the timeline, render it, and then I send it back. So it really is not that laborious for me to do. Um, so that is the primary camera that we have. And we would give you a tripod as well. The issue with this camera is it needs to be plugged in. So oftentimes we'll give you a, a, an extension cord as well so you can find power. So it, it's not something that you would typically shoot outside. But most lectures are done indoors um, in rooms like this. So, okay, we're going to get extreme, real extreme here. Um, 
extreme basics of cinematography. So I just wanted to give, like, that's, that's what we have. Obviously, you can, we'll talk about how you can reach out to Marcom for, for bigger video projects. But for your, for your lives, where you're shooting with, on your own, it's good to understand some basic uh, tools and tenets of cinematography. Um, important basics not really covered today. Even though we will get into DSLRs a little bit with some of the focus stuff, um, we won't really get to talk about white balance um, or gimbals. Um, most cameras that you guys use will auto white balance, um, but white balancing is kind of a crucial thing. Basically, it tells the camera what's white. So if you're shooting outdoors or indoors or in a place that mixes color temperatures, outdoors, tungsten, or sunlight, it'll, you can white balance your camera and it'll tell that camera what's white. Because if you don't, then it'll look blue or it'll look orange, and it's kind of one of the basic, everybody, every kid in film school messes that up once before they understand white balance. But all these cameras have auto white balance, so no to worry. Uh, gimbals, uh, nowadays, it's pretty easy to buy a a pretty inexpensive gimbal that you can use to put your iPhone or camera on and then track through the streets and have a, a you know have a, you know basically it steadies out your shot. It's like a it's a, a prosumer uh, steady cam in a sense. All steady cams have gimbals. All drones are based around gimbal technology. They fly, but the gimbal keeps the weight that keeps it weighted, so you're able to manipulate your image and keep it smooth while you're flying through the a the atmosphere. Um, DSLRs, you know, I have a DSLR at home for myself. I shoot pictures of my family, my kids. It's great to have. Um, they all come with lenses, zoom lenses, and prime lenses, but we'll get into the zoom lens bit a little bit later. We'll talk a little bit about, about lenses and different kinds of lenses. But we don't rent out a DSLR in Markham. We have them. We shoot pictures with them in some video, but we don't lend them out. But, like for instance, we have, we have something at St. Joanne right now, one of our student workers is taking pictures with the Marcom DSLR. So proper framing. Um, again, I don't really know cowboy. That's not really, that's not in my lexicon. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, it's a good way to see how things are. I mean, it's an extreme close-up is um, again. These are more cinematic tools. But if I'm like, well, let's get a close-up of this person, uh, you know, extreme close-up. You know, I think of something very dramatic. You know, the good, the bad, the ugly. Everyone's about to, you know, do a little standoff, or whatever. Um, but also you get extreme close-ups of um, insert shots, like things of importance. Like say I'm in a, a scene and I'm digging into my pocket for my chapstick, it would be an extreme close-up if I took out, you know, if it was, sometimes it's, for, for details that's important. Um, but in terms of framing a person, you don't really want to get too close. I would never, I, I, the, the way that we shoot and the, the way that you should shoot is kind of, I would go for the medium shot where you see more of the body, because um, we can always crop it. You know, if, if you shoot an extreme close-up, you can never, you can never crop out. We can never see the rest of the frame. Um, we can always push it a little bit. We can crop something. Uh, you know, obviously a full shot, if it's an action shot, you want to see more of everything. I, I always recommend shooting at a wider angle, which we'll get into a little bit, and more of a, a wider shot. Because again, we can always crop it. We can't crop something from a full shot to close up because we're going to lose a ton of resolution. It's going to look pixelated. Unless you're shooting in 4K. 4K, 4,000, it, those, those shots are so uh, clear and that those files are so large that you can crop a wide shot into a close up and it'll look seamless. That's why um, when we're shooting professional shot shoots, they're all shooting 4K or 8K or 10K. Great. So, so Mark, Mark has been great to work with on our website for the content updates. We really um, are looking to add some videos, you know, those short 45 seconds to one minute clips. 
how much capacity does Marcom have to help us in that effort, like a new accounting video or for finance majors? And is that something that we schedule with you? I mean, it seems like that's kind of a really high quality video and just saying the word, the pitch, the diction. Maggie does good with that on the videos when she coaches us, but to get some of that content on there, how much capacity do you have and what does that process look like? Um, everything like that has to be submitted on the Marcom website. You basically submit a form and, uh, and then we get into it. Maggie will pass that on to me and I'll talk to you about what your expectations are, what's your timeline, what you're looking to do, and then we'll really get into what kind of video you want to do and, and the logistics. Um, but that, it all starts with, with submitting that form. Um, in terms of something like that, we'd like to schedule, you know, a month, two months out. Um, obviously, I mean, so we can really take our time to figure out what we're doing. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much what we're doing. Yeah, and we and we've done. We a couple of years ago, we had a very big initiative about creating content for each department. And we, would, we did a lot of uh, videos that lived on their landing pages. We got away from that a little bit, but you know, I think every department's different. I mean, if you have video needs that you want met and you need, that you think you need, then you should submit forms and we can figure it out for sure. Um, okay, so basic framing. So this is some nice proper framing for an interview. You can see he's sitting at the table. You can, you know, he's got some headroom. He's got the ability to move a little bit. And hopefully, we'll just we have them all in frame so we can, we can capture his movements. He doesn't move out of frame. The frame is large enough so that he, you know, hopefully he's moving, but it's all within frame and seems like a relaxed shot. So we can focus on him. Whenever we move the camera. It draws attention to the camera, and it takes away from what he or she is saying or something. That's why it's important to try to put it on a tripod, keep it steady. That, that framing is not so great. It's just too much headroom. Um, we're not really seeing his body. Uh, the, the, um, the show Mr. Robot did very well with very strange framing, uh, which it worked for that show, but it doesn't really work for shooting videos. Uh, that's way too much effort. And then if I, if I received a video like that, I would crop it, but then we would just miss out on so much and it would look pixelated, it wouldn't look as good as it could. So definitely try to give your subject some good headroom. So a bit about lenses. This is not really gonna factor into shooting with the camera we lend out, but it's good to understand wide angle versus telephoto lenses. Because if you have a DSLR that has a zoom lens, a long lens, if you open it up, it'll allow you to shoot wide angle. But if you zoom in, you'll be able to skip ahead for a second, you'll get more telephoto. So basically what happens is when you're shooting a wide angle lens, you have more of a more of what you're shooting is in focus. You, know, you can see some of the details, this bin, that chimney, whatever that is. Uh, and that's a wide angle 24 millimeter lens, which is probably the widest you can get um, on, a, on a DSLR camera. Like if you see uh, like the Coen brothers or you know, Citizen Kane, they're shooting at 10 millimeter lenses. It's often extremely wide. Uh, Coen brothers get even distorted. They're going so wide with films like Huck, Huck, Sucker Proxy and such. Um, but in a, it's a, you can see everything. Like if you're shooting a large crowd of people, I would try to open up the lens so it's, it's wide, so you can see as much as possible in focus. Um, as you zoom in a little bit, which is standard, but here, you, she, she's really in focus. The subject is in focus, and everything else is out of focus. Presumably, the camera is in the same position. It's just, we've just zoomed in on her a little bit. Um, if you want to accentuate the importance of what someone's saying, then maybe you want to go more telephoto. The issue is, you need to have a little bit more scale in your focus pulling because if she moves, if she backs up, she'll be slightly soft. Her focus will 
will not be as sharp. So the more you practice and work on your photography and cinematography skills, the more you can have a feel for focus. Um, uh, with phones and stuff too, more modern phones, um, you're going to have like on the iPhones with the three lenses, it's built so you have that wide angle and then that telephoto lens as well. So there are a lot of cases where you can do those things with your phone too if you just kind of explore it. What are the kids shooting? Point, point 0.5? Yeah, point 0.5. If you want to be cool, shoot everything in point 0.5 yeah. and then you're good. It's a new thing. <laughs> That's what the kids are doing. What's also about something about telephoto is um, it really flattens the image. Like you see a lot of telephoto lenses used in action sequences because of films because it makes things look more urgent and closer than they actually appear. You know, um, while a wide-angle lens again you can you can there's more deep space. You understand where things are in relation to each other in in actuality. But the telephoto lens really just focuses on that subject. So portrait mode, it, it, it utilizes a telephoto lens, and that's why it takes beautiful portraits and, and sort of fuzzes out the background. Lighting. Your best sort of source of light is the sun. That's the sun, you didn't know. It's large and majestic and very bright. Um, it, it, I mean, if you can shoot outside, it'll, it'll make everything look better. Uh, but, you know, there are some pitfalls to shooting games with the sun. I mean, it's very bright, you get shadows. Shooting outside, there are a lot of pitfalls with sound, elements. If you're inside, things are a lot more controlled. So whenever I shoot an interview, I typically don't go outside unless I can really control where I am. Uh, on campus, there are always, there's always someone, you know, you know, running the lawnmower. You know, there's always, there's always, Students moment. I mean, students are pretty quiet. It's really the the the, the landscaping. The landscaping is a killer. The, the planes, planes flying overhead. Uh, so whenever I shoot with the, with President Nelson, we you know we always have to figure that out. Um, but it's, it is the best source of light. We don't rent out lights. Um, we have lights. <coughs> I use them, but we don't rent them out. But you can find ways to. sort of create your own lighting setup. Um, in, a, in an ideal lighting situation, you have a subject in the middle and you have a key light, which I actually put a little bit here, a fill light and a bad light. Key light is the main source of light on the subject, illuminating the front of one space. The fill light is filling in the shadows on the other side, just to make sure, so we don't have like The Godfather or Michael Corleone is looking, <laughs> which is an incredible shot, uh, but no, no fill light was used. So, um, so you wanna see the, the whole face. And typically the fill light, the power of the fill light is uh, to a lesser degree than the key light. The key light is a stronger light. And the back light is something in the back of the subject, but that creates a sense of distance from the background. And yeah, ideally, you'd be able to see the back of that person's head and see where that person is in space, as opposed to just being like a black blob of background. You know, if I'm in front of, if there's a light behind me, you can you can sort of differentiate between one's surroundings. Uh, not in this slideshow, but we should avoid shooting in white walls. Let's avoid shooting on in front of white walls or surfaces that are bland. Um, color is always good. Um, if you can find something like that. This might be too dark, but something that is like a nice earth tone is a bit better, and it'll accentuate your lighting a bit more. I mean, you could take a, a lamp and put it in front of your subject, and that could work as a key light. It might be better than just shooting that person without anything. Again, you can always fix it in post. It's better to have you can brighten things up in post, but you can also sort of uh, darken something, bring down the light. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you're going to have lights to do all this, but these are good, these are good things to have. Um, now that's a beautiful shot, but 
Um, it's not ideal for an interview because you're using the, the best source of light in the world and it's silhouetting our subject. So we want to avoid shooting into the sun, shooting into bright lights. If we turn that subject around, we'd actually have some perfect light on it. It's a magic hour, as they say. Um, great job. So this is, you know, I think this is, you know, I don't know who this guy is, but he's well lit in this shot. You know, we can kind of see some stuff behind him, like there is some kind of light coming from this way as well, unless it's so bright that it's illuminating that, but that's actually good to see. Um, and you can see his face. I mean, if you, if you, like even if you are doing a Zoom call, you know, you want to be illuminated. Um, from, from a light source, it's probably coming from your computer. You don't want, well, this guy's sitting by a window, same guy, he's sitting by a window, he's got the Godfather lighting, he's, you know, you don't know if this guy's gonna give you a job or <coughs> show your job. <laughs> you don't know about this guy. This guy, you can trust this guy. You can see his face. Um, it's also kind of a bland background. This has some texture. So be mindful of what you're shooting in terms of lighting, but also what's behind your subject. And now you all have green lights. So you have That's right. Light. That's right. So, say you shoot something on canvas. You think it's dynamite. You love it. Um, it's something that you think could actually promote the university. It's, you're not proprietary about it. You're like, you want to share it. You're like, wow, I saw this thing. I was in the eco lab, and you know, I, I saw a bat swoop down and eat a squirrel. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to see that. I want to see that. Um, <laughs> upload it. <laughs> upload it to, uh, there's a link on our Marcom site where you can upload footage to Canto, and we can see it. There's no guarantee we're going to use this footage, but it's always good to have things stored in a large repository in case we need it. Um, you never know when you're going to need footage. I mean, footage of someone or something. You know, I, I would say that if it's a if it's a lecture, it's an hour long. That's not something you have to. That's something that you're perhaps you talk to me about, and then maybe you would put it on Marion's YouTube or something like that. But if it's I don't know a great shot of I mean, again as. In Markham, we rarely, I rarely, I don't get into dorm rooms. I don't, you know, obviously there are certain factors there, but I, I don't, I'm not on campus all the time. You know, I'm not there with students at seven o'clock on a Saturday. So, we could always use it. Um, if you think it's, if you think it's uh, worth saving. Some last things to remember. Do the best with what you have. Um, obviously, you know, shoot, shoot, you know, if you're, I, I doubt you'll say to yourself, wow, I, I don't need lights, and you know, I'm in front of a white wall, and my lenses are terrible, and you know, I'm not gonna shoot. Well, if you don't have the, the means to do it, still do it. If you want to shoot it, shoot it. You never know. We can maybe fix it in post. We can straighten out an image. Um, it happens a lot. A, a tripod is slightly askew. It's, it's so easy for me to just rotate that image in Adobe Premiere and like make it look as if it's perfect. Fixed exposure. If something's a little dark or a little light, I can brighten it up or darken it. We do this with pictures, but also with video. I do a lot of saturating. Saturation is nice. Color is nice. Let's let to brighten things up a little bit. Puts me in a better mood. Uh, so yeah, if something looks stale and just bland, we can break it up. One, one note I just want to add really quick is I know we get a lot of really great assets, of photos that are taken in the moment. Um, they work really well in a digital sense, but then when it comes to print, it's a whole different story. So just, you know, when something is low quality, um, we can't then just make it high resolution you know, out of nowhere. It kind of has to come from that source. So just want to keep that in mind if you have a dream image. It would be great for digital, but it might not always work for print. So, just to put that there.
Any questions? I'll get two. First, you mentioned right there at the end about uploading content to you guys. What do we need to think about for release or permission, especially if it's a student involved? Like, do we need to do anything, documents? If so, is there a standard process for that? My understanding is that all, every, everyone's fair game on campus. <laughs> is that, I mean. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that if you're if you're on campus, um, and students, staff, or faculty, well, especially students, I mean, there's a process that they go through when they first register okay. that releases that. Um, when we're doing like really specific campaigns, we'll oftentimes have a, a, an additional release because we know we're going to use those in multiple markets. Um, the other question is, um, and you mentioned that you can you you got Adobe Premiere and some other things. Are there editing tools for the masses that you would recommend? If you're doing it for social uh, or kind of like that kind of quality, there's a really great um, there's great apps out there. Um, one that I like to use is InShot uh, for that kind of thing. Um, I'm sure Peter can give you some other good ones for kind of a more if you're using a camera or, uh, or trying to get a more uh, universal shot. But for social, I like InShot or even iMovie sometimes. Uh, those things are pretty easy. Yeah. I, I skew Mac. I don't really deal with PC stuff at all. I okay. uh, send emails on PC, uh, write, write uh, PowerPoints. Uh, but I'd say, um, <clears throat> yes, I think iMovie is a great. I don't really know a lot of the social apps. Canva.com. 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 That's a video editor. Also, depending on what you do, there are creative licenses for Adobe through Parent. I mean, I, I don't. I don't pay for it. I get it. I mean, obviously, that's my job. But um, there are, there might be some ways to get like, Premiere, Photoshop. You definitely um, can get. I think you definitely can get both of those things. Yeah. They're like cards. I just put Photoshop on my computer. Yeah. If you go to Adobe, um, and you can, there's a whole bunch of creative stuff you can download. I mean, the thing is, you have Creative Cloud as well. Yep. Oh, there you go. But I just. I, I would get also used before too. And yeah. The, the thing is, if you're using your PC in your office, Adobe Premiere is not going to work well for you. Because if, if you're using a program like that and you're shooting proper files, ideally you, they would live, they, you would dump them to an external hard drive. You would never put them on your PC hard drive. That would could crash your PC. I don't even put stuff on my Mac. It slows down your computer. Macs don't crash. Everything I put, everything I shoot, it, I put on these external hard drives. You know, five terabytes, they're, they're dirt cheap now, honestly. Um, and then you use that through a USB port, and then you all the media lives on your external hard drive, but it just runs through your, your computer for the application, but you save everything there. All the large media files are there. Um, yeah, I mean, and then you could, I mean, it really depends on your setup. If you're shooting on a Mac, you, in theory, you could keep all your footage on the cloud and just use the cloud as your hard drive. I don't do that. I, these files are oftentimes really large. Um, so, but yeah, I would say that if you're interested, just shoot IT an email and hopefully they can get you set up, but it's worth messing around with other apps. Did you have a question? Yes, um, going back to your first question, what about miners? So in, we do like the healthcare can, and like those are some really great like shots and videos. We probably can't upload that. Miners. Yeah, we, you know we. Those students, we, um, when they kind of go through the process as well, they're signing a room. There's a language within um, the sign up that gives gotcha. you the right to use it. Yeah, I would also review the working with minors policy that comes out through the general counsel. Uh, I'm sure that's addressed here. That's you. We've never, we've not never, but rarely had an issue with someone not wanting their like this used. I think there was maybe one or two times where we had to. And, and, and I respect people not wanting to, you know, be shown. I don't, you know, I don't want to, you know, ask forgiveness and not permission. I, I'm in, in my producing life when I create stuff. You have, I always get people to sign their likeness uh, away to me so I can use it. But um, but it, it's 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 definitely something to be mindful of. But in terms of students, they are fair game faculty staff here on this campus. 
I think they can be used. Uh, and if someone says, you know, I don't want to be used, then maybe you take it down. But it's, uh, that's, that's all, as Maggie said, in, in the fine print. Um, Flickr, we, we do not have video assets on there. Um, so, but if you need video assets, Peter would be the person to get in contact with because he has a repository of everything that we would lo loan out, I guess, as far as a digital file would be concerned. Yep. Yeah. And then for any still images, Flickr is a good um, place to pull some of those. You'll find pictures of yourself there. You can even notice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sign the like this. So, okay. So, basically, sure. how you get there, like a link? If you just go on to Flickr and search Marion University, yeah. it brings up a whole page mm -hmm. with albums that go back to like 2012. Yep, any image on there you can download in a variety of resolutions as well, so depending on how you want to use it. Oh. Yep, well, and for any video, Peter would um, use yeah. our repository. I, I would say that you would go to the Marion, yeah, you go to the Marcom page and you'd submit a request. And you'd say, I need, like, say you wanted drone footage of campus. Exactly. I have a lot of it. I have it. I, I'm the key for it. So you say, yeah, I need all this drone material. I'd email you and say, oh, what do you want? How much do you need? And then I would go through and I'd send you what you want. Because we have a lot of drone footage. We have, we have stuff of students. We have, you know, we have stuff over the years. And we're constantly shooting more footage. We had a, a great drone photographer here last week shooting stuff. Uh, Kaida Wagner and Skyline. And we can definitely to modernize a lot of our, our footage. Um, we, I mean, especially now that we're not through COVID, but when things are, in, you know, better, more, for, we have a lot of antiquated footage of students with masks that we're not going to really mm -hmm. right. use that much. So mm -hmm. it's time to start anew. So, but yeah, if ever you want footage, say, submit a request. Yeah. What's the typical lead time that you would like certain requests submitted? So usually from our seats. We needed it yesterday. And I know that in your positions, things were really hard to get those things out. So it would be my to just go for your work. Yeah, those are those lead times that we need on photos. I'd say if you wanted to schedule video or photos, you should, it should be outside of two weeks. Um, like, if, if, like, say there's an event and it's hard and fast, like there's an event, we're doing this. Like if you submit something two weeks ahead of time, there's a good chance we'll be able to cover it in some way. And that's, I could shoot something, I could lend it to you, we could have a student come, or we can outsource it to a professional photographer. I mean, these are all things that are in, in the works. We do outsource things to other photographers and videographers as well. But a lot, obviously that, you know, I'm a, I'm a cheap date, you know, I'm free. You know, this is free, uh, but, once we get into outsourcing, we're talking about budgets, and that's uh, you know a different thing. So um, I'd say two weeks. If if it's a longer project, you're like, wow, I need to shoot. I want to do this really incredible promotional video for some whatever, and I want to do interviews, and you know it's going to be five minutes, and it's going to be incredible. That's going to take more time. That would you know I would say two months because we would meet. We talk about it. I probably meet with you in person to discuss it. We have to bring in stuff, like figure out where we're shooting all this stuff, the subjects, and then you know, like I'm editing this thing for the Ancilla uh, Changing Lives Center. And they gave me two months, but we have to shoot interviews, and it's still sort of coming down to the wire. But it, um, I mean, it's a five-minute video. So it, when you have lots of pieces, it's going to take more time. But I, I think most of you guys have event driven. I would say two weeks. So I know that this has been asked in a bunch of different ways already, but I have a different angle. So the the minors, the faculty, staff, all of them are kind of covered. We do a lot of events that are alumni, guests, employers, things like that. Um, I don't think we've ever had something on there saying like when they sign up to come or volunteer or whatever that we potentially take the picture of you. Um, so should we? And then if so, do you guys have language or something that we could or should use? 
Sure. So there's a, a university document that I do not know the name of, but it basically is like when you're on our campus, when you're on any property that's owned by Marion, we have the right to, to record and utilize your image. So you would not have to specifically indicate that for every event that you have. So once they kind of step foot on, onto the campus, they're covered under that policy. And then we have students have sort of a, a second wave when they're registering to kind of sign up to say, you know, we could likely utilize, excuse me, utilize your image in marketing campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it doesn't have to be specific to every single event because there is a larger umbrella coverage. So we're all ready good. Just like at a tailgate, I'm going to take pictures of everyone. They might not even have gone here or anything, right. but right. they have a problem. Yeah, they're on the property. Yeah. They're here. I'm going to take a photo. Okay. <laughs> like, well, good, because that's what we've been doing. Yeah. <laughs> I know global studies typically has, they have people signs. But, but in those situations, we're often using their PowerPoints. And so there might be some more like legality issues there. Um, yeah, it's good, to, it's good to be mindful of. I remember when we shot the the uh, etiquette guy, <laughs> all the oh, etiquette yeah. stuff. We, I mean, we never asked him, but he was gracious and would have been very poor etiquette for him to deny us. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. Uh, probably my favorite thing I've ever been in America. So, um, Mark, uh, do you have any tips on improving audio quality when shooting with iPhone? Great question. Uh, <clears throat> honestly, I think audio is reign supreme. I think that you can always get by with bad video, but if it's bad audio, then there's not much you can do. That. So, um, the, the, the most basic uh, recommendations I have uh, are to shoot somewhere that's quiet. Um, to, it's all in the pre-production. I mean, it really depends on what you're shooting. Uh, with something like this, with a camera like this, you, you don't have that much control. As long as you have the camera close, it's omnidirectional microphone will help you. Um, I, I'm trying to think like what kind of, um, I'm trying to think what, what, what might you be shooting with? Like, the, might and with your it. iPhone? Yeah, with iPhone, yeah. a lot of times it's outdoors. Yeah. It's, it's kind of in the yeah. moment. Yeah. So for me, um, I know there's lots of times where I'm like asking people little questions for stories on Instagram and things like that at big events and it's often hard to hear them because there's so much happening. Honestly, I went on Amazon and I bought a tiny microphone. And it's cool. It's really great. And it just connects to my phone directly and I just put it out and people will answer my questions. And so for that kind of thing, um, yeah, I there's not a great way, um, you know, being close, trying to be quiet, but if you're in a big crowd, it's really you're gonna need some kind of little mic or anything. But honestly, it's really cheap on Amazon. It's like six bucks for a little tiny microphone. But yeah, that's good. Try taking your um, case off too. Yeah. I was gonna say, do you guys know the communication center? Mm -hmm. uh, they rent out free like materials that you can use, uh, that free microphone um, and stuff like that. You can just get it on Lend and sign the paperwork, and they give it to you as long as you need it. Yeah, that's it. The communication center is awesome. I feel like people don't really know about it. It's not affiliated with Marcon, but it's. Uh, I actually was just there about a month ago for the first time. Um, they have soundproof rooms. If you ever want to shoot something in a relatively controlled place, it's a good place to do it. They have ways to crop, you know, to they have uh, tripods for your iPhone. They have podcasting equipment. They just got a DLSR camera too, I think like this week, and I believe she said that they're willing to lend it out. Perfect. And, yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. Does the library run out anything? Do they have They, they used do. to have flip cam. I don't know. They have a variety of things. I mean, yeah. I know they have, Go they have GoPros. GoPros. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what else. Yeah, the GoPros could work. Yeah. The, flip, uh, the flip cameras are real old. They're yeah. cool, but they, I think they're dead, dead technology. <laughs> dead technology really good. Mm -hmm. But they're cool. But they have, but they have things there if you mm -hmm. yeah. can't get anything else. Yeah. So yeah, Media Center, Library, Marcom are three you know sources for some equipment that can can be looked at. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, I'd say um, if you need me, want to reach out to me. That's, there's my email. Um, submit a request on Marcom. Uh, don't be a stranger. Marcom is here to help you guys. <laughs> with every, with every, I, I, They're on official tagline. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me.
your friends about this series because we'll do great social and deliver and another video and other social I believe. So yeah, there'll be a social media one on October seventh. So if you want to learn just a little bit more about um, catering to different uh, platforms and kind of best practices, um, advice, things like that, I'll be doing that one on October seventh. Anybody have a